So thank you, Sarah. And thanks, Kelly, and everybody who put this together. Let's have one more round for everybody who put this together. So I was going to say, I don't know how I got roped into this, but he's sitting right there, so I cannot lie. I got roped into it by my big brother, just like all the crazy stuff I've done my whole life. Um, so looking into the camera here, I didn't realize the camera was going to be so close. If I had, I might have clipped the nose hairs this morning, but hello to everybody on the internet. Um, it's exciting to be here. Uh, this is a bigger crowd than what I expected. Um, and so, you know, I like to start out when I'm speaking to a big crowd, I like to start out with an apology and try to just hit as many people as I can beforehand. So to all of you who ever have or ever will sit in the seat in front of me on an airplane, I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. You're not going to be reclining on the trip. You're not going to enjoy any comfort on the trip, but I assure you, neither will I. So <laughs> it's, it's equitable. Um, Apology number two, there's a lot of Clearwater people here. I, I worked at Clearwater a long time ago. Um, I want to apologize to any developers who work on any code that I ever touched. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but it could be worse. Just ask Jarek Anderson. He, he, can, uh, he can attest to the fact that it could definitely be worse. So um, quick note to everyone who, who someday may be a keynote speaker. Just a little bit of advice to you. Um, layers, you want to dress in layers. If you sweat as profusely as I do, the layers can kind of cover it up. Um, and, and if you know, the sweater doesn't quite do it for you, the other trick is to take a couple of paper towels and roll them up and, and <laughs> duct tape them under your, your armpits. So just for those of you who are ever speaking in the future, a little bit of, of advice. So I want to start out um, and take a little bit of a nostalgic trip down memory lane. Um, this, to me, is very nostalgic. Um, but first of all, a little call out to animated GIFs. I, I, I knew I had to get an animated GIF in this talk somewhere, and there it is. So that's pretty exciting. <laughs> um, how many of you guys and girls recognize this operating system? We've got some CVM basic lovers here, lovers. Um, this was the first thing that I saw when I was introduced to computers and computing. The first screen um, that I ever saw that got me interested and excited about using a computer. Um, it, it, you know, a lot of computers back then were kind of like this. You plugged it into whatever television you had. In our case, it was a little black and white piece of junk with a, a dial on the side. And James is nodding his head. You kind of had to go up every once in a while and tweak the little dial on the side to get it back to the to channel four, channel three, or whatever it was that we had to hook it into. So that was kind of fun. Um, the operating system there for the VIC-20 was basic, and, and that was pretty cool. So here's an advertisement right out of Compute Magazine for my first computer. Um, now, if, if Captain Kirk is presenting a computer, it must be a pretty exciting and awesome computer. <laughs> the Wonder Computer of the 1980s, under $300. Notice the little quote there, the best computer value in the world today. Hey, if William Shatner's saying it, it must be true. The only computer you'll need for years to come, and I can attest to that. This is still my, my daily workhorse. <laughs> so the cool thing about this computer let me back up a little bit. We got this computer from my uncle David, who was a computer programmer. Anytime that he upgraded a computer, we'd get his old, his old workhorse. And uh, so he upgraded to the Commodore 64, and we got the VIC-20, which is um, a pretty awesome computer, actually, for kids. One of the cool things about this computer is that it came with some pretty cool manuals. This is uh, one of the manuals that our, that our uncle brought to us and gave to us when he was dropping off the computer. Um, Cool thing about this manual is that um, it just jumps right in to programming. So the, the, the shell for the Commodore VIC-20 is CVM basic. And you drop right into the shell. And the first thing you do is you start programming. Okay? So the first thing in this manual was write a little program. right? So that's the first thing that I got to do on a computer was write a, write a program. So take a look at this program, two lines of code, 
right? My first program was an infinite loop. <laughs> yeah? And, and, and that was good training for me because I can't tell you how many infinite loops I've, I've programmed since then. Um, some of you, again, who've worked on my code can probably attest to that. Um, so pretty cool little program. Print VIC-20, go to one, build a screen with VIC-20s, right? Now, this was pretty sneaky of Commodore to do this, right? Not only are they teaching you to program, but they're advertising their product, right? You think Facebook is bad. Here we are 35 years later, and I'm still advertising the VIC-20, right? <laughs> So um, then, you know, after a couple weeks of, of printing out static streams, we started to learn how to do a little bit more, right? We started to learn how to use variables, how to assign values to those variables and, and manipulate those values. Um, I know there's probably some, some Haskell zealots in here right now that are looking at this and looking at line three and going, wait a minute. Mutable variables, this is crazy, what are you doing? Um, but hey, that's the kind of wild west that we lived in back in the 80s. Um, so really awesome programs, right? Um, we got to do a lot of interesting and exciting things there. So uh, as we continued to go through the manual, it got more and more complex. We learned how to peek and poke and do for loops and how to do go subroutines and all kinds of cool stuff. And eventually, you get into the, the uh, appendix, and they had all these cool little games that you could type in. This was programming. This was the way that we played games back in the day, right? You, you grab a manual or a compute magazine. You type in the code. You get it to run. Eventually, get it to run, right? We're learning how to debug. We're learning how to figure things out. Um, take a look at this one. This is pretty cool. Tanks versus, tank versus UFO. Anybody play this game? Come on, is this me? James is nodding his head. Take a look at line 21 there. I mean, how random are those line numbers, right? I'm pretty sure line 21 was a total afterthought, and I can totally see how this happened. Some product manager came up to the developer and said, you know, or, or filed a JIRA ticket and says, hey, our beta users can't figure out how to use this stupid program. Why don't you add some instructions? So, all right. Insert line 21, print Z left, C right, B fire, right? This was, this was fun and interesting back in the day. Um, so the next thing that I had, the next and maybe the last thing I need to say about this computer was um, we, we were able to store our programs on a cassette tape. We had a little cassette drive. Um, you stick the tape in and you can, you can um, record programs to it, and you can load programs from it. So just a little drive through how you did that. You stick the cassette tape in. The first thing you do is you rewind it all the way. You hit the reset button on the counter so it gets to zero, right? Now we know we're at position zero in the seek on, the, on this drive, right? And then you fast forward it to right before the point where you think you recorded your program. Hopefully you wrote it down on the tape, you know, position 281, tanks versus UFOs, right? So you'd Fast forward it to position 275, and then you'd say, type in load, right? And then it says searching, right? And you have to hit play on tape, okay? So you're doing your own seeking here. Um, you're kind of managing your own file allocation table. This is how we learned about file allocation tables, by doing it manually, <laughs> right? I heard a chuckle. <laughs> we, got, we, got, we got some real geeks in here. Um, so searching, searching, and while it's searching, you're making your peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and you come back and eventually, ah, found the program, right? And then loading, you go clean your room, you go on a hike, go for a bike ride, you come back, and eventually your program's loaded, you run your program, and, and, and there it is, right? And this one was pretty exciting. This was one of the, the fun programs back in the day. Okay, so... Um, specifications for this computer, 5K of RAM. Now, you could upgrade that, but we never got the opportunity, so we were working within those, within those constraints. About a 1 megahertz CPU, um, which is about 2,000 times less than what you've got in your pocket today. 
um, probably even less than that if you consider the specialization of the hardware we have today. We had a cassette tape, like I said. The screen was 22 columns by 23 rows of 8 by 8 pixels. So we had 176 by 184 pixels. To put that in context, the classic NES had almost double the resolution of this one, almost twice as many pixels and a lot more colors too. And it was expandable, right? Um, so, so why do I bring this up? Why is this interesting? Um, what I want to talk about today is how constraints drive creativity. Even though this computer was so basic and so, so small in terms of what we see today, it, it enabled me and a whole generation of people to learn how to program, learn how to become comfortable with the computer, learn how to build their own file allocation tables, et cetera. It, it allowed us the opportunity to build things. One of the biggest constraints of this computer was no internet. Now, you could eventually buy a 300 baud modem. You could connect to this thing. But you know, in Lower Utah, there wasn't a, there wasn't a uh, um, BBOS system anywhere near us that we could have connected to. So we had to figure things out, right? We had this little system. We had this little TV. We had to figure things out. We had to type in games from Compute Magazine. We had to mod those games ourselves, which was a lot of fun back then. Hey, what happens if I tweak this variable? what happens on the screen, right? So, you know, we had a lot of fun with this, but I think it, it enabled us to be very creative because it constrained us, but at the same time opened up our ability to, to express ourselves. Um, so, constraints. Creativity. What is creativity? This is the Merriam-Webster definition of creativity. The ability to create. The quality of being creative. That's a really terrible definition, in my opinion. <laughs> so let's look at a different definition. So a product is creative when it is novel and appropriate. A novel product is original, not predictable. The bigger the concept, the more the product stimulates further work and ideas, the more the product is creative. Okay. So in order to be creative, something has to be new. It has to be different. It has to be created, All right, not predictable. It's something that's surprising. Um, and it has to be useful, too. So creativity. Why do we care about creativity? Well, creativity is what enables programmers to write their first line of original code. It's, it's what allows product managers to identify new markets. It allows designers to create more effective user interfaces. As managers, as business owners, as entrepreneurs, as software developers and designers, creativity is what's going to drive us to the next level. Creativity is what's going to make your business really useful and really interesting and really different from the last thing. Okay. All right. Anybody know what that instrument there on the left is? It's a theremin. You guys have all heard theremins. If you've ever listened to Halloween music or the Beach Boys, um, Good Vibrations, you've heard a theremin. Okay. Really cool instrument. You don't actually touch it. You kind of wave your hand around it. It's kind of magical. And the cool thing is you can, you can modulate the volume with one hand, and you can modulate the pitch with the other hand. And, and with that, you get the whole range of sound. And you can run this through all kinds of processors and do all sorts of cool things. The reason I have the infinity sign over this is because it's infinitely variable. You're not constrained at all. Now, is this the kind of instrument that you would give to a kid? Well, maybe if you want to get a migraine, right? <laughs> right? No, you want to constrain. In order for them to be able to express themselves, you need to start by constraining. So what do we do? We go to a keyboard that's got 12 notes per octave. Even more constrained than that is we go into the key of C or whichever key, right? Break it down to seven notes, OK? What about five notes, OK? What if we go into a pentatonic scale? Right? If you've ever listened to um, Stevie Ray Vaughan or Jimi Hendrix or anyone who's played on that scale, or how expressive can they be with just those five notes in that, in that octave? Super expressive. Okay? And so my contention and a lot of research has shown that when we apply constraints to a problem, we actually open up the human mind to be able to be more expressive and to be able to be more creative. Okay? So it's, how we apply those constraints that's really important. 
So here's an exercise that, um, that, that kindergartners get to do. All right. Take a, a blank piece of paper, scribble on it, hand it to your neighbor, right? And then the teacher says, okay, I want everyone to take that scribble and turn it into a cat or a dog, right? The constraints are what is, what is written on the paper already and what does the teacher want you to write, okay? And time after time, what we find is if we give a kid a, a blank piece of paper, versus give them some constraints, the one with the constraints ends up being more creative. Art classes do this. So if you, if you go to art school, your art professor might say, hey, here's, here's a, um, a still life sitting on the table. I want you to reproduce this still life with a sketch, okay? But let's change a little bit. Let's pretend like there's a light source up here. Let's pretend like there's a source of shadow right here, right? Now, with some of those constraints, they can start to use their imagination and how they want to reproduce that and how they want to build that thing. Um, there have been some tests and interesting studies on applying constraints to artistic endeavors like that. Give it to a blind judge afterwards. Those who had the constraints ended up having perceivably more creative pieces of art than those who just started with a blank canvas. Okay, And don't forget Bob Ross, right? What happened every time Bob Ross had an erratic brush stroke? Oops, right? Or the, you know, the chisel went somewhere he didn't expect it to go. He didn't freak out about it. He said, hey, that's a happy little accident, right? Let's turn it into a tree, or maybe it's a cloud, or it's you know, a pathway in his, in his little painting. So I think if we follow Bob Ross's lead and set ourselves up to have more happy little accidents, that we can be, we can be more creative. Okay, um, so what are some of the different types of constraints? I mean, this is a small list of constraints, but here's some of the, the ones that we face as, as product managers and software developers and designers. We have financial and budgetary constraints, timelines, deadlines, legal, contractual, informational skills, experience, staffing rules, all sorts of things, right? There are a lot of natural constraints um, that we deal with, okay? What about the laws of physics? That's a, a big constraint, right? So one of my favorite sports, motocross. Anybody recognize this particular game? Yeah, Excite Bike. That was a lot of fun. So the thing to me that makes motocross so interesting is the constraints. It's the obstacles that are put on the course, right? It's the turns, it's the jumps, it's the whoops, it's all the different things that get in your way of being able to go fast. Um, one of the coolest one, of course, is, is the jumps. So here I've got depicted a, a, what's called a double jump. You've got to clear this gap. Now, we all know from Isaac Newton that because we have a fixed angle of departure and we have a fixed distance between the, the ramp and the landing, that we have to hit it at a specific velocity if we want to land that jump, right? If you go too slow, what happens? You're going to case your bike, and you're going to get hurt, right? If you go too fast, you're going to overjump it, and you're going to flat land that thing. You're going to come down 25 feet straight onto the ground, bottom out your suspension, and probably break your back at the same time, right? So you've got to nail that thing at the right velocity. So nobody's passing anybody on the jumps. They're all going the same speed on the jumps until this guy came along, right? So this is James Bubba Stewart, a, a um, motocross racer, who figured out, because of that constraint, he got creative, and he figured out a way to change, not physics, but to change the way he approached the jump. So he figured out a way to kind of pre-jump, lay his bike over, change the angle of the jump, and therefore be able to ride faster over the same jump and still land the thing, right? Pretty cool. This is, this is what it looks like in practice. So the, you've got the guy there on the left who's doing the normal kind of boring jump. And then you've got the guy there that's scrubbing it. And that's what James Stewart uh, called it. He called it scrubbing the jump. Basically taking the face of the jump and changing the angle. So now, do you think his coach told him to do that? Do you think his trainer said, hey, James, you need to figure out how to scrub that jump? Nope. He figured it out. He figured it out through trial and error and a lot of practice, right? So throwing those obstacles at him 
and eventually gave him the opportunity to be creative and do that. So how do we usually go about solving problems? Whether it's software development or anything in business, whatever it is, right? We have a problem, we have our status quo, and usually the way we go about solving these things is we say, okay, what, what features do I need to add to my status quo in order to solve this problem? And, and with that solution, we end up with an evolution, okay? There's another way to do it, which is, let's take the status quo and let's add some new constraints. And the scary thing about this is that there's not a straight line from where we're trying to get to where we're trying to go. In fact, when we're, when we're building creative solutions, oftentimes the path is undefined. We don't quite know how we're going to achieve what we need to achieve. But by defining the problem in terms of the constraints, rather than in terms of those features that we need to add, we give our developers the latitude to be creative and to come up with solutions that we didn't think of um, and to ultimately be innovative. So some examples of this, right? This is a complex uh, freeway interchange. What was the constraint that was put in place on these engineers that had them come up with this type of solution? No stoplights, right? No traffic signals, okay? We know how to solve this problem with multiple roads coming together with traffic signals. That's easy, we've done it a million times. But until we said, take away the traffic signals, we didn't come up with this really cool, complex, but at the same time, elegant solution um, to, the, to the problem of traffic and interchanges, all right? Node, okay? Some people love it, other people hate it. But what was the genesis or the thing that caused us to come up with new ways to use JavaScript on the server. Same thing. Take away the semaphores, right? Anybody speak Spanish or another Latin-based language? Semaphores, stop signs, right? Take them away, right? So when we said, you know what? Let's take away threads. Let's take away mutexes and semaphores. How do we still manage asynchronous code without those constructs? Well, we've got to come up with a new way of doing it, OK? Not totally novel or new, but using JavaScript on the server was definitely a novel approach. What about Tesla? Was Tesla's constraint, was their big constraint no gasoline? That was certainly one of them. But I would contend from the beginning, at the very beginning, Tesla's first constraint was they constrained their audience, their target market, right? Now they're going after more of a kind of middle class target mar market, right? But when they first came out with the Tesla Roadster and with their luxury lines, it was, hey, these are gonna be expensive, but you're gonna get something novel and cool, right? But I think the real constraint that drove the innovation with Tesla was this idea that we've gotta be able to drive an electric car from Los Angeles to New York City, right? And how do you do that? Well, you install a network of superchargers. I think that's Tesla's number one innovation is this network of super superchargers they put across the entire country and across the entire world, right? Now they're competing with companies like Audi and Volkswagen that are trying to kind of replicate the success that they've had with their electric vehicle lines. Guess what those, those companies still are missing? This big innovation. So the constraint of being able to not just commute but to drive from coast to coast makes a huge difference. What about SpaceX? What were the constraints that drove the innovation and continue to drive the innovation at SpaceX? We gotta get people to Mars, right? Now we've already gotten rovers to Mars, um, but you can't just drop people on a hostile planet, can you? Right, you've gotta, you've gotta have a nice smooth landing. So they had to develop a system that can bring people down onto the planet, but even more important than that, we gotta have a way to get people back, okay? And none of our existing technology will allow us to do that. So the big innovations at Tesla weren't just how do we get commercial Tesla uh, uh, payloads into space at a more cheap price point. Really, if you've, if you've listened to anything that Elon Musk is saying, it's how do we get people to Mars and back? And that's what's driving the innovation there. What about React? Love it or hate it, it's a very popular 
uh, framework these days. Okay, what was, what was the big constraint that drives that innovation there? Well, we don't want to manipulate the, the document object model. No manipulating of the DOM, right? So maybe it's not as slow to manipulate as we thought it was, but that was their big driving, um, their big driving constraint. Let's get rid of jQuery and, uh, and that changes the way that we approach the problem entirely. How about uh, communicating over the internet and encryption, right? Communication's easy when we know that we're talking to somebody and nobody's um, intercepting that flow. You put Eve in the middle of this situation, then Alice and Bob are no longer talking directly to each other. There's somebody else eavesdropping on that conversation, right? So the first constraint was, hey, we've got to create a, a system of communication that allows us to talk to each other knowing that someone else can intercept every single byte of data that we're transmitting to each other, but still keep it private, right? And even more importantly, we have to be able to exchange our keys over that public line of communication and still keep it private, right? And that's what really drives the innovation there, is that constraint. So I like to talk about the, the US Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Right, so we know that the US Constitution is a system of checks and balances between the different uh, departments, branches of the government. But what about the Bill of Rights? If you look at the Bill of Rights and read through it, um, you know, you'd think, hey, this is a document or a set of documents that grants rights to US citizens, right? How does it do that? It does it by constraining government. Okay, so it's, it's, it's written in a form of constraints. Congress shall make no law, shall, you know, the citizens shall not be infringed, no soldier shall, et cetera, et cetera. If you read through it, almost the entire Bill of Rights is written in terms of constraints on government. It's not, it didn't try to say, hey, here are all the features that we're gonna dump on our citizens. It actually defines it the opposite way. Here's what we're not gonna do to our citizens, right? There are a couple, the Sixth and the Tenth Amendment are written more from the perspective of, of the, the users. Um, but in essence, they still do a great job of constraining government. Okay, salesforce.com. I mean, this was, their, this was their, you know, their advertising campaign was no software, right? And how did that change things? I mean, there were other companies at the time that were also pioneering SaaS, but Salesforce was the one that came out and said, hey, this is a big deal, no software, we're not gonna force you to install it on premise or even in your data center. You don't need to have you know, systems administrators administering this, software updates are gonna come over the air. All of that came from this concept of no software. Now granted, it was more of a marketing ploy than an engineering ploy, but it worked really well. What about AWS and the other cloud providers, right? What, what, what were the constraints that drove and continue to drive the innovation there? Well, no infrastructure, right? No on-prem, no data center, right? How about no servers? Think about everything that we've achieved in the last five or so years since Lambda and other serverless technologies have come out. It's really changed the way that we think about building systems that scale. So um, in preparation for this keynote, one of the uh, sources that, that, that was really interesting to me is this book, Stretch, um, by Scott Sonnenschein. And Scott talks about a couple of different mentalities. There's a couple of different ways to think about the world. One is as a chaser, and the other one is as a stretcher. So, Chasers are looking for better tools. They're looking for more resources. They're basically asking the question, how can I get more and how much do we want, okay? So whereas stretchers figure out how to adapt existing tools, they figure out how to, to make alternate, alternate uses of tools, and they tend to stretch. They stretch their budgets, they stretch their teams, they stretch their time. They're able to get into a mentality that um, that works better in that situation. So they ask the question, what do we want? 
as opposed to um, how much do we want. So one of my pet peeves is, is you know, when people are starting new businesses, we inundate them with crazy questions and we throw stuff at them that's not, not helpful, okay? Um, every VC is going to ask you when you try to start a business, how is this going to scale, right? Now, that's an important thing, ultimately. Businesses need to scale um, if a VC is going to invest in it. Uh, but what kind of mindset does that question automatically put you into, right? Does it put you into a stretch mindset, or does it put you into a chase mindset? The other question is, what is the total addressable market, right? And I think a better question than that is, how are you going to carve up the total addressable market so that you can create creative solutions that, that actually work for the people that you're building this product for? So um, if any of you read anything that Paul Graham says and puts out, one of his most popular um, quotes is, do things that don't scale, okay? What does that mean, do things that don't scale? He doesn't mean do things that will never scale. He means attack problems that are highly constrained, that are difficult to solve, that at first require a lot of human effort, right? Eventually, you'll figure out how to make it scale um, through your creative solutions. But rather than being chasers, we need to kind of change our approach to be uh, stretchers. Stretcher, that's an interesting plan of words. All right, so a couple of the projects I'm working on that, that uh, I think are kind of fun. Indie Dwell, um, we're building affordable housing. We've got a lot of constraints that we're working under. Um, the constraints for us are they have to be affordable, they have to be healthy, they have to be good for our environment, and we as a company have to be responsible. We have to be responsible to our employees, we have to be responsible to our clients, and we have to be responsible to communities that we're building in. Um, and because of those constraints, we're able to do some really interesting things. Another constraint that we have right now is we have to build our homes starting with shipping containers. And because of that constraint, um, we've been able to do some really interesting innovating. The other constraint is just because it started as a shipping container doesn't mean that it needs to look like a shipping container once it's, it's on the ground, right? We actually want homes that are healthy and good to live in and look decent. Another, um, another company that I'm working with right now, and a couple of the, few of the Gather guys are here right now, is Gather. Gather is building software for the funeral home industry. Now, who would, who would attack a problem like that, right? Software for what industry? Um, and sometime you need to talk to Zach and ask him why. And it's a, it's a really great, great story about why um, we're building software for the funeral industry. There's some really interesting problems we're solving there. And if I had more time, I'd get into all of the different constraints that, that are driving the innovation at that company. Another company um, that we're working with is called Goodwell. And um, we work with employers to help build businesses that are better for them, better for their employees, better for their communities, um, and be better for everyone involved. Um, and you know, one of the interesting projects there is uh, how do we get feedback from employees without in inundating them with these giant employee feedback um, surveys? And so if you're ever interested in figuring out how we've turned a you know, multi-page survey into a two-question survey that still gives companies as much or more information about what their employees are thinking, come talk to me sometime. Um, I'm going to end it there. And I think we have just a couple minutes. Do we have a couple minutes for Q&A? Maybe one or two? We got five, so maybe one or two. Does anybody have any questions? You're going to make this real easy for me if you don't. Yeah? How tall are you? The question, <laughs> this is a good question. The question is, how tall am I? So I'm five foot 20. <laughs> And for those of you who don't do imperial math in your head, too bad. You'll have to figure it out. <laughs> and by the way, James is five foot twenty-two, so he's five foot nineteen. He says. So, 
Great question. Thank you for the, I love softballs. Any other softballs? <laughs> yeah, what Kelly. What constraints did you face uh, when you were in the early days of Clearwater? Oh, great question. Kelly asked me, what constraints did I face when I was in the early days of Clearwater? Um, certainly one of them was resources. I mean, you know, Clearwater now is a multi-trillion dollar company. Um, and you can throw gobs and gobs of money at anything, right, James? James is nodding his head. Yeah. <laughs> we'll throw gobs and gobs of money at anything. No, we were constrained in terms of the, the, the amount of cash that was available and what we had to get done with just a couple of developers, right? So just a couple developers. Another big constraint was where are we going to get the data, the market data from, right? Things were a little different back then. And when you don't have gobs of money to throw at market data solutions, you get creative. And I won't go into all the details of how we got creative or how it might have, have um, bit us a little bit later on. But you know, let's just say we might have figured out how to reverse engineer certain protocols. And within the constraints of the license agreements, we were able to figure out how to pull data out of systems that perhaps weren't engineered with an API or SDK that originally uh, was meant to be used that way, right? Another constraint was, you know, nowadays you guys are probably working with every single bank on the planet and they're happy to just hand you all of their data without any questions or issues, right? I'm sure. Back in the day, we had to do a little thing called screen scraping. I don't know if you do any of that now, but um, it got a little bit intense at times, um, figuring out how to scrape screens and do that when a little security key fob was in place as well. So um, yeah, there was some fun stuff that we got to do there. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Uh, how do you put constraints in place if you're operating in what I would say like the Quebec Ooh. and you have a blank page, how do you actually? Yeah, that's a really good question. The question was how do you insert constraints into a, into a system that maybe doesn't have those? How do you create opportunities for creativity, right? And I'll throw that back at you guys. Everybody's in a little bit different situation, but similar to the the, you know, the exercise of, hey, let's scribble on the paper and then use that to open up our, our opportunities. I think part of it is as, um, as product managers and as, as developers and managers and engineers, rephrase the questions, rephrase the problem in terms of, you know, how can we, how can we solve this problem with constraints as opposed to just adding new features, right? So one of the questions, one of those is, you know, can we actually take away from the user interface and use data science or machine learning or be creative, some other method of getting that data or input, maybe not directly from the user, but maybe through some other, you know, point of view. Um, I, think, I think people are like tapping their, their watches saying, hey man, you gotta wrap it up. But yeah, um, there are a lot of different ways to add constraints. Um, and we can talk about some of that offline too. So anyway, I just want to thank everybody for the opportunity to talk today and uh, have a great DEF CON.